Okay, this presentation is being recorded. I'm Shane with the Rockland Public Library in Rockland, Maine. And tonight we are welcoming the Shire of Hadchester, the local branch of the Society for Creative Anachronism. We've been planning this presentation for the better part of a year and it has had to change course, of course, um, as we have moved all of our programming online here at Rockland Public Library as have most of the libraries in the country. I would like to start by saying a huge thank you to the friends of Rockland Public Library who support our programming both on site and virtual throughout the year and I would like to let you know that they will be having a socially distanced book sale on the front lawn of the library that will be coming up um, on September 12th and September 13th. I'm going to tell you about a couple of programming programs coming up here at the library. Next Thursday, September 3rd, we are thrilled to kick off the Camden Conference and Rockland Public Library Partner Talks. There will be five of them uh, over the next few months. We will be welcoming Rhett Talbot, an award-winning journalist, for a virtual talk, Melting Ice, Vanishing Fish, How Climate Change in the Arctic is Affecting Maine's Fishery. That will be next Thursday at 6.30 on Zoom. If you're interested in attending, please uh, email me at sbillings at rocklandmaine.gov, and I'll make sure you get the link. And in two weeks, on Thursday, September 10th, we will have a virtual wildlife talk with park ranger Catherine Owen. Catherine is the new park ranger at Maine Coastal Islands National Wildlife Refuge. She's going to be talking about the work done by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and also giving us more specifically um, an overview of the Coastal Islands National Wildlife Refuge work in preservation and protection. So if you're interested in that Zoom presentation, email me as well at sbillings at rocklandmaine.gov. Now, I get to introduce this fantastic group. We are welcoming the Shire of Hadchester. That is our local branch of the Society for Creative Anachronism. The Society for Creative Anachronism is an international nonprofit volunteer educational organization devoted to the research and recreation of pre-17th century skills, arts, culture, and more. Tonight we are welcoming several members who are going to be giving us a recreation of a 10th century Viking family meal. And that's why we have called this presentation Dinner, Crafting, and Games. 10th century style and you will indeed be seeing um, dinner crafts and games so without further ado i am going to turn things over to our wonderful guests and i am going to um, ask them to unmute and take center stage so please welcome the society for creative anachronism thanks for being with us tonight thanks for having us Hi, I'm Sean Bailey, mundanely known. Uh, I am the owner of the Fat Friars Beatery in Newcastle, Maine, but more importantly, I participate in the Society for Creative Anachronism. We portray different lifestyles and ages, and I represent a, a ninth century monk. Uh, and I'm going to take you around the village and let you see what we got going on. We got some textile arts, some games, but more importantly, we're going to be doing some really good cooking with Yiffer Donaldson. Also, our Yarl, who enjoys cooking. Let me see if I can show you. This is Yiffer. Hello, everyone. Please tell, tell us about what you got going on. Um, so we were lucky enough to catch ourselves a rabbit this evening for dinner. And he's been up here roasting on the spit for a couple of hours now. Uh, we had a nice fair bit of stores in the ship lar uh, larder when we came up shore. So we had crushed juniper berries, a little bit of thyme, a little bit of... Uh, spruce tips that we could use to crush up with sea salt and rub it down. Uh, and this has also been basted with honey water. Um, inside this, we have a nice pottage going. Pull it up for you here. 
So a pottage could be used with a lot of different things. A lot of times during the winter time, you'd see them with stewed turnips and uh, different types of oats were often used to thicken it. This one was made with dried peas, wild foraged mushrooms, uh, wild onion, borage, leeks, a little bit of nettle, uh, and just water and sea salt. And that's stewing down nicely for us. There, and then on the griddle there, we have something called leve, which means to live. Um, and it's a flat bread that was often made. Let's see if I can get it over here without it falling. Don't drop it in the Don't fire. Don't drop the fire. Um, and these guys, they're probably getting about ready to flip here. Oh yeah, nice and golden brown. These are made out of ancient grains. So um, this is mostly rye, spelt, a little bit of buckwheat, um, honey, buttermilk, uh, and fennel seed with sea salt. Um, and we're just going to put those directly on the fire. Oh, no. Oh, no. Those off. Five it. second rule. Five second rule works. I'm going to put these directly on the fire to finish crisping up that underside. And those will be a lovely little thing to have with the rabbit and the pottage. Give us a little something of sustenance to put on our bellies along with a cup of meat or two. And yeah, that's about what we would do for a Viking meal. If anybody has questions or anything about how it's prepared, I'm glad to answer. If anyone has questions, please let us know. We'll be happy to answer them as we go along. Um, lots of times we would be eating variants of preserved fish. Um, we do have salted eggs. Um, also salted lamb shank was used a lot, lamb haunches, that we would salt all during the spring and hang them until they dried, and in the winter we would shave it off and eat it. Uh, but this is a nice change, for sure. Fresh meat. Fresh meat. A lot of people don't think the Norse were known for their cuisine, but the Norse diet was actually quite expansive because of all the trading that they did. They got to bring in spices that weren't common to their area different things that they could bring into the larder that wouldn't have been exactly capable of growing in their current environment. So for that, we have lots of spices that come in in Nordic cuisine that you don't actually think of. You think of fennel, you know, licorice flavors, lots of dill, stuff like that. Um, anything vinegar based and fermentation based. A lot of people don't realize how much the Vikings were traders. Oh, absolutely. Uh, I mean, that Viking was a job. It was, I'm going out to, raid and go out here and bring the riches back to my family, maybe find and procure some new land. Um, but primarily it was so they could gain goods to trade with. And explore. And explore. So that's how it was done. Okay. Well, that was great. I'm gonna walk on over to the table and see what's going on over here. Do we so have what else do we have on the table? What do we have here? Early apples. That on, we, let me turn this around. All right. Early apples that we picked off a tree as we were walking by. Seasonal berries that we picked off bushes as we were walking by. Some nuts because they keep well. We can travel with them. Crack a bunch. Mm. Fills the belly when you're hungry. A rose hip and sumac tea. Provides vitamin C mm -hmm. and a little bit of tart taste. Yes. I think we may have boiled, stewed that a little long for that. Here's to you, brother. Yay! In, in, a, in a regular Viking household, um, the householder or the wife wouldn't necessarily have what we think of as sets of dinnerware. They wouldn't be a bunch of matching plates and a bunch of matching bowls. Each person had their own individual place setting that they were responsible for bringing with them wherever they went. And occasionally, if it was an extremely wealthy person who was having a really large feast, they might provide um, tiles of dried bread, and those were called trenchers. And you would eat your food on the trencher 
and it would soak up all the juices and then you'd eat the bread. So there were no dishes provided by the host. So we also have, um, where you'll see all of our people coming and grabbing their particular place settings. Most of what we have is wooden because it travels well and weathers well too. It weathers well and it's sturdy without being expensive. And if you lose your spoon, it you floats. can always just card, carve another one. So Ifer's bringing dinner to the table. Grab your plates, gentlemen. Go grab your plates. That looks done nicely. Forks were not commonly used in this particular time and culture, so oftentimes you would eat with a knife. Both to cut your meat and to eat it. How's it taste? It's a lot like grilled chicken, which I know everybody says everything tastes like chicken, but this actually is like chicken if you've never had rabbit <laughs> before. Where's your potter? It's over here. Oh. On the table? Uh, I didn't know if you wanted it directly on here. I hear the ghosts wailing. <laughs> it could be the, the it could be the coyotes in the background. Those sprailings are up to something. What is a scrailing, Drigby? Oh, I caught you with your mouth full. Since the Norse were explorers and traders, they were several centuries ahead of Columbus in visiting the North American continent. And in so doing, they also had interactions with the various native peoples that were here at the time, whom they came to commonly call scrailings which in Old Norse means something akin to outsider or foreigner. The interactions were roughly the same amount of positive and negative that they might have had with any other culture. It might be that they came to raid and pillage, or it might be that they came to trade and establish positive relations. I hear you might be gambling with a few of them, huh? Possibly, although... I am, I am talking to a monk here, so maybe I should keep my deeds to myself. Ah. Oh, let's see that pottage. That looks hearty. It is definitely hearty. Where's the butter? Would you pass the butter? Yes, thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. You serve me some? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. It's a shame we don't have enough for everyone in the audience. <laughs> you folks want to try some of mine? Here you go. Maybe. Okay. Well then, would you if like to? If you have questions, can you, pass me the butter, please, you can put them in the chat function at the bottom of your window. And that way we will be able to know that you have questions even though everybody's muted. And um, Steph Near at the head of the table will relay questions from the chat and we'll do our best to answer them. Anybody have any questions about dinner, pottage, roasted hare, some nuts and berries and apples? Why doesn't the monk get to eat? <laughs> Who said he doesn't? <laughs> Well, are we going to move Thank on and much. show some? Uh, if there are no questions. Ah, uh, wait. Do we have a question there? <laughs> Great, our first question. We have a question from Robin uh, Wood. Robin do both, Wood. Do both the men and the women share equally in the cooking? Hmm. I think that's a good question. Yeah, had... Actually, sort of. You'll find with Norse culture, the men and women share equally, sort of. In the home setting, there's a division of labor <laughs> where men are out hunting, 
plowing, tilling, working with acreage, um, doing the animal husbandry part, and women will be in the house um, doing most of the cooking. However, men knew how to cook because the people that we think of as Vikings um, traveled a lot and they didn't always take women with them. So men knew how to cook. They knew how to forage for edibles in whatever environment they were in. They knew how to recognize wild onion, wild thyme to spice up their meals. And every traveler would carry his dinner service and small cooking pots so he could make individual things. So they did um, share the cooking chores evenly, just not necessarily at the same time. And I also saw that there were a couple of the same question from Marianne and Rocket was the first one to ask it about uh, where did the rabbit come from? Mm -hmm. This rabbit in specific, if you would like to know, was from a local farm in Washington, Maine called Hawthorne and Thistle. It's actually owned and operated by another Scadian. Um, which is our, our way of saying a SCA member. <laughs> yes. Yes. Can others join your group? Absolutely. Great question. Welcome. If if you look in the chat, you will see a link to SCA.org that has all kinds of information about what we do and how to become a member. You can also look at eastkingdom.org. The world is divided up into kingdoms and you didn't know it, but you live in the East Kingdom and you've just gotten a new king. He was crowned a week ago. His name is Tyndall and his consort's name is Albrecht and they have begun their six month reign. And all the information about the East Kingdom, which is where we live, will be at eastkingdom.org and it's in the chat. And so you can click that link even while you're watching us if you want to go open another window. Was it acceptable for women to hunt? Yes, absolutely. Um, women used axes and bows and spears just like the men. There's some debate among historians about whether women were shield maidens. Some historians think that's a myth. Some historians say, oh no, it was true. Recent evidence of some of the raids from on uh, England show that half, about half of the bodies that were buried are in fact female. So about half of the people who were attacking the monasteries and died in the process were women. So we go back and forth and we re-examine the, the, whether it was the reality or the myth of the shield maiden and whether or not women bore weapons. Certainly not all women did. And yes, they hunted. And someone did want to know where we are mundanely lo located. We're actually in the woods on our private property in Waldeboro. All right. So are we about ready to move on to the next segment? Certainly. While these gentlemen are finishing their dinner, wait, gentlemen. <laughs> Let me show you a little bit about textile arts. The women of the Scandinavian cultures were prolific and very skilled textile artists. Woven cloth was in fact so bountiful that it was a major export. So when the explorers, um, we, we, we usually think of them as men, although evidence is showing they may have been half women, went on their trading missions, they would fill up their boats with cloth that the women had woven and furs and precious stones like amber and other things from their uh, local area so that they could trade it for things like spices. So, and the work was never done. Women worked on this all the time because everything that we're wearing right down to our shoelaces had to be produced by either leather work or textile work. So if you walk over here, I'll show you a little bit about whip cording. I'm working on making some new shoelaces because my gentlemen have worn through their shoelaces, so I'm making some new ones. Follow me. This is whip cording, and if you look closely, you'll see it's in a red and white spiral pattern. This is made with wool, it's plied wool. And I would have spun this myself. 
and plied it myself. And now I'm weaving it because it makes it stronger. See that? And we would use this for ties at the various parts of our clothing, shoelaces to tie up our bundles, any number of things that anything you would use string for, we had to make the string. So whip cording goes like this. We have two colors. Pardon the wailing of the ghosts here. So what I'm gonna do is this corner and this corner are going to trade places. And now the other two corners are gonna trade places. And then this, these corners will trade places. And then these corners will trade places. And you keep making the corners trade places. But you after a while, you get the hang of it and it goes pretty quick. I'm actually slowing it down, which makes it a little bit harder. Whoops. Oopsie. Yeah, because it will twist unless I can control it better. But in order for you to be able to see it, yeah. I want to make sure that I'm, no, there I'm going. I looked away for a minute, forgot where I was. <laughs> and when I get to where this is, the, where the braided part is long and my working pieces are short. What was the rest of the question I got? Did, did the Vikings have a lot of line? I, it only gives me the first part of the sentence. Have much linen. linen. Of course, they have wool being far north. Yes, flax grew in their um, in their geography. They they would have acres and fields of flax, and that was part of a woman's work to ret bast fibers. It's difficult in the archaeology to actually tell which bast fibers they're looking at. Lin flax was not the only thing that the, um, the Scandinavian cultures used as a bast fiber, and it's all classified as linen. Some of the bast fibers may have been nettles. Uh, you will hear fairy tales about people who are spinning with nettles. Princess, uh -huh. Well, common girls who become princesses spin with nettles. Uh -huh. um, so yes, they did have a lot of linen, and if you, will look, if you were to look closely at the clothing that we're wearing, most of it is made out of linen. And they also, um, did blended fibers. So there would be some things that would be linen and wool blended together. Because the Scandinavian cultures that we call, that we think of as Viking, um, did a lot of traveling, they also had silk. They did not import uh, raw silk or spinet, but they imported lengths of woven cloth, which they then cut and used as precious trim on their linen and wool clothing. So this is wool because it's what I happen to have. It's easy to transport and I like the way it works out. It's also warmer in the winter. It is warmer in the winter. And the Scandinavian women were able to spin wool so fine that it made um, lightweight summer garments. Oh almost see-through, like a wool gauze. Interesting. I'm not that good at spinning, so I'm working on it. <laughs> <laughs> so, in, so this is called whip cording, and there are other um, sequences, braiding. You can see I just switched directions here. Did they have any type of looms? They did. Uh, the, they had warp-weighted looms, and they were upright. So we think of a loom as laying down on a table and you beat this way. The women um, had looms that stood up against the wall and the warp went over a bar at the top and had weights on the bottom. So rather than it going around and around two bars, it was uh, hung with either large rocks or bags of small rocks so that the weights were all about the same and that's what created the tension. Oh. Oh. They also did though, speaking of weaving, walk over here, I'll okay. show you another type. We'll get that nice dinner in the background too. This is called tablet weaving. 
It's a small portable loom. These uh, tablets were commercially prepared. You can see that they came from Halcyon Yarn. Plug, Hello. Plug for Halcyon. Hello, Halcyon. We love you. <laughs> and the cards themselves have four holes. One, two, three, four. And I have two cards. And the fiber goes through the holes. And then you'll see here's the space in between. This is what's called the shed. The shed. The space in between, a weaver's term, this is called the shed. And when A and B are upright, there's this shed. You can see there's two red ones in the back and two white ones in the front from, where, from your perspective. Though my perspective is 90 degrees. And I have a small stick shuttle that I had one of my gentlemen carve for me. Well, shave it anyway. Yeah. So it goes through the shed. I would have this and attached to my belt to provide tension. tension. So let me put that in my belt. There. So the shuttle goes through the shed. Now, if you watch, you will see that when I turn this, when A and B are up, I'm going to turn this both cards forward one turn. Now B and C are up, and you can see that now there's two red on the top and two white on the bottom. So the shed has changed. So weaving is all about over and under and over and under and over and under. So now I've changed the over under. And the shuttle comes back through. And now I'm going to turn it forward one more time. And now C and D are up. And we're red in the front and white in the back. And the shed has changed. And the shuttle goes through. And then rotate again. Do you have to pull it down for tension or to tuck it down? Or? Yes. Oh. If, I were, if I were actually like seriously ah. trying to make my edges line up right. So the shed has changed again. Now we have white on the top, red on the bottom, and the shuttle goes through again. And we beat with the cards. And then eventually, as I keep rotating forward, the shed keeps changing. I know my hand is in the way. Beat with the cards, roll forward, it changes the shed, the shuttle goes through. This is weaving just like any other loom, except, whoops. Oh dear. Um, these cards are easily transported mm -hmm. and they make small four strand weaving. Red, white, red, white. Mm -hmm. For trim on the edge of a garment or shoelaces. <laughs> we go through a lot of laces. We have to make our own rope. <clears throat> and we can do that out of a lot of different kinds of fiber. And contrary to what people think, um, Vikings were not like dirty barbarians. Savages? They, right. They actually enjoyed color in their clothing. And the skill of the dyers was uh, also superb. So you would get these colors with a bleaching solution, mostly out of ammonia. Mm -hmm. And this one, a combination of matter and maybe a little bit of indigo. Do we want to know where the, the, the ammonia comes from? It comes from exactly where you think the ammonia comes from. Urine they saved was their pee. Yes, urine was a ubiquitous resource, and in fact, in some places, it was illegal for you to throw it out because the dyers needed it to extract pigments. Where would you get the red? Matter. Yeah. The red color. The red matter. Oh. It's a What's it's a root. It's a root, matter, M-A-D-E-R. <laughs> matter root will make red. Cochineal, which is actually um, a kind of beetle, and they would crush the carcasses. 
uh -huh. and make red. Um, lichens will make uh, rosy pinky reds. Uh -huh. So that's how card weaving works. And I showed you whip cording, and that's like a small piece that I was doing myself. There's another way that the Vikings would have done whip cording, especially with larger lengths. In order to set sails, we would need bigger ropes. And you can make rope the same way you make shoelaces. You just have to use bigger um, strands. And so that's hard to hang onto your hands and do this way. So they would do whip cording in another way. And I've got Trigby, whoa! <laughs> Trigby and Hakon are working on a piece of whip cording together. As long, whoop, as long as you have um, a place overhead that you can hang it. If we were at home, I'd have a series of hooks along a beam at the top of the house that I could attach various weaving things to. Or you might just do it outside anyway, because you this might. is a great way to get outside and enjoy the nice summer weather if you feel like it. Good activity for the kids. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, and children would learn to do this at a very young age. And it would probably develop a lot of coordination. Oh dear. It does. And this is another, uh, we think of like sea shanties mm -hmm. as the kind of song that people would sing while they're hoisting line or rowing a boat. There would also be songs having to do with whip cording oh. or weaving or, um, and there's a whole genre okay. and category Might of work. They songs. not have a long rope. What was the, what was the rest of that question? Might they not have a long rope walk arrangement for making long ropes? Yes. Uh, we have this swung over a tree branch. What we might have is a hook or a ring up there. And then as the rope gets longer, we just pull it further in the ring and wind it around the tree. And then they make another length of the braid and we just haul it up and you make another length of the braid because once you get down like this, you can't be slinging and catching those bobbins anymore. Bad for the back. Bad for the back. Bad for the bobbins. Bad for the bobbins. Bad for the rope. Right. How, how the about an indoor shed? shed for, the settlement. for the settlements? An indoor shed? I, I'm, I'm not understanding the question. What are you, are you meaning that, how about an indoor shed for the settlements as in like, would this be where, what you would build? Oh, um, yeah, so uh, every settlement, every actually homestead, even like a single family, would have, sometimes they would have the, um, the warp-weighted loom up against the wall in the main house. Sometimes they would have a separate weaving building. Uh, of, uh, a rope walk within the town. To... Oh, yeah, that would be a good, um, a good use for rope that you could make this way. Oh. If you're trying to build a bridge across a little piece of fjord from one cliff to another, you could make a rope walk. Hmm. So. So that's three different types of braiding and weaving. Um, do we have any other questions about weaving and braiding and textiles? I don't see any as of now. Well, that was pretty interesting. Maybe now, after dinner, we could find out what would happen to, for entertainment. Mm -hmm. Any of the fellas know any of the entertainment things we would do, like games? Oh, oh, I do, I do. Who does? Trigvi. I have a couple oh. of board games here, oh. although that's A quick not... question before we go. Do you, shear, do you shear wool? Do I personally shear wool? No, I don't. But yes, they would, they would shear their sheep. Um, just the way we do now, only they would use hand scissors instead of electric shears. I don't shear sheep. Um, I, I'm not very good at it. I'm likely to hurt the sheep. Uh, oh. Most And make sales out of wool or... I only get part of the sentence. Or what? Or what? Oh. We, there, um, there hasn't been a lot of research on what they actually used for the sails on their boats. Oh, the sail clock. Because the, the um, archaeologists were much more interested in how the boats were built. 
The textile artists are just now getting on board with actually looking at the finds. The other piece is, the other bit of information is that, of course, the textiles don't last as long. Yeah, so they decompose quicker, they so it's hard to- They decompose very quickly. Linen decomposes faster than wool, um, but we have reason to speculate based on the amount of fiber it would take to make a big sail that the sails were probably made out of wool and woven wool at that. Cool. They were dramatically heavy, uh, but then the sails would also be used once you, once you beach your boat, this, you can take the sail down and turn it into any number of things like- A tent? A shelter. Uh-huh. If you use your long oars to make a cross piece, and spread your sail over the, the structure that you've built out of your oars, you have a Viking A-frame tent. Kind of neat. Multi-purpose ships. Um, are there more questions? Stephanie, do we have questions? I don't see any of them. Okay. Okay. So the gentlemen are going to take a break from doing their whip cording. They've done their three inches for the day. <laughs> and uh, they're going to play a game. Play a game. Actually, two games, maybe three if we have time, but let's stick for two for right now. So this might be something you would do after dinner if you didn't feel in a storytelling mood, even though they had a rich oral history. The first game I'll be demonstrating is knuckle bones. These are the literal knuckle bones of a goat, but you could really use any similarly dimensioned object like nuts or small stones or something of the like. It's played by inserting a knuckle bone in between each of your fingers, picking one up in your dominant hand and leaving your non-dominant hand firmly on the table. It's, it's quite similar to Jack's, if you've ever played that. The idea is you throw one up in the air and try to catch one of these in your hand before the first one hits the ground. I'll try and demonstrate. All right. Now, since I have two in my hand, the object becomes toss one up, set the other down, pick one up, and catch the other one. Sounds so like you need to toss a little higher. Yes. I think so. Oh. Oops, I missed it. So th at that point, you might elect to do a number of things. I, in this case, I'm going to elect to give my opponent the chance to see if he can do more than I can. And this I is probably- can't even do one. Ah, what's the bet? What's, yeah, what's the bet? I bet he can do more than one. Nope, can do one. Well, I lose whatever it is, so there we have it. Okay. I got a silver that says he can't even do one. I didn't do one. All right, now let's, let's bet for real this time. All right, let's go. You guys realize this is yeah, being recorded. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right, so what's the bet? I bet a silver. That he's gonna get one or not get one? That he will not get one. Oh, I'm gonna put one down that he does. All right, so here we go. Oh! Yeah, pay it up. <laughs> All right. Any other bets? Oh! Well, you put it down, but do you have to have it between your fingers is the question. Do I have to have... Do you, when you put the one down, does it have to be back between your fingers or is it put it down on the table? No, when you put one down, it can be anywhere on the table. It okay. can be just on the ground, if you like. Or okay. Not on the ground. You can't just drop it. You actually have to set okay. it all the way down. Okay. But you can set it two down. Two that he won't land. No, you got three down there. Two that he won't I got two. Oh, three. I got two that he will. Two that he will. Okay. Oh. oh. That hit me in the nose. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> So in beta, beta. <laughs> that is how you play knuckle bones. You might have bets going on like this. You might have people egging each other on, trying to see what else they could get out of it. There could be a lot of things that are going to be happening. Like who might have to wash and scrub the pot? Something like that, yes. So that means you have to wash and scrub the pot. No, I already took my silver. Oh, come on. I'm sure you've all been wondering what's going on here. Well, all this is the board of the second game we're going to be showing, which is called Nefetapu. How's that spelled? H-N-E-F-A-T-A-F-L. Who said you, were, you couldn't read or spell? You did. That's right. <laughs> this was a board game, and it's a little bit more complicated than Knuckle Bones. 
and it's oh. commonly considered to be, it's sometimes called Viking chess. There is reason to believe that this was considered to be a game of high class people, such as Nephitophel sets being found in the oh. graves of people who look to be, have been very wealthy. And this particular game being described in one of the, that's not who set those up. Was there a question with that in Nephitophel or was that just a statement? Just okay. You. It's right. proper spelling so people can look it up. Ah. Did I spell it incorrectly? I don't know. I'm sorry. No, I, I put I, it in the chat. Oh. Okay. So this was considered to be a quote unquote rich people's game because it is described in the sagas as among the examples of things that the nobility or the upper class might typically do, alongside other things such as swimming and storytelling and the like. If anybody has played chess before, this is gonna sound quite familiar, but now that it's set up, here's how it works. The, the board can have a variety of spaces. This particular board is 11 by 11. All that's really important is that the board have the same amount of spaces on each side and that there be an odd number of spaces. How odd, how very odd, as odd as you can possibly make it. So in this, the object of the game is, it's commonly considered to be knights, which here are represented in white versus Vikings who are represented in red. The knights must get the king to one of these four corner spaces, in which case they win the game. The Vikings win the game if, uh, if they capture the king. And how do they capture the king? Do they well, land on him? Well, firstly, I should say all pieces move like rooks do in chess, which means they can move any number of spaces up and down side to side. You can move one piece at a time. A piece captures another piece if two pieces are on opposite sides of it. So in this case, this piece would be captured. To capture the king, you have to surround him on all four sides. That's kind of tricky to do. The king starts at the center. It seems like the, oh, reminds me of a Pentecostal, what? What's that? Oh, hey. what was that one, Steve? There's a question? No. There is a question. These spaces with X's on them are also counted as pieces for the sides of the knights. So if I had a Viking here and you moved one of your pieces here, this piece would be captured. And with that out of the way, let's actually play a game so we can see what it's all about. So Haken, would you like to play the knights or the Vikings? A, pen table, a Pentecostal um, board. You know, okay. I'm gonna make it easier for you. Get them All right, for, yeah. you are playing the Vikings. I am play playing. I'm playing the Knights. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. I got them for you. Free protein. Okay, so, so I'm the Knights. You are the Vikings. That means you go first. All right. This is a fairly nicely put together set even if i do say so myself because i'm the one that made it and you're also but, humble and i am i am the most humble person on the face of the earth you're the most humble you person notice. you know but you could just as easily play this game with a plank of wood with a scratch together board and some sticks and twigs if you really felt like doing it that way it not, there's nothing that says it has to actually be a rich person's game you could play it just as easily if you were poor and knew the rules but it was commonly considered to be a rich person's hobby because it was a leisure activity. Oh, that's a bold move, Cotton. Mm -hmm. Also, the king, just like any other piece, can capture other pieces. Oops, excuse me. And you cannot jump over pieces. Pieces do block each other. So we have our first combatant dead. And only the king can occupy any of these spaces with an X on it. No, normally the spaces on the corners are called the doors. 
and this space in the center is called the throne because that's where the king starts. Uh oh. Uh oh, he's in trouble. It's not looking good for the Vikings. <laughs> All right, and so in this case, I win because I'm playing kings, excuse me, knights, and the king has successfully escaped the room. There's reason to believe that this might have been used as a sort of training war tactics game because there are a lot of lessons to teach, such as guard the exits, make sure that you surround a foe if you can and outnumber them before attacking, that sort of thing. If one were of a warlike predisposition, it could just as easily be used to teach tactics and strategy as to just simply enjoy the night. We're missing the other thing here. There we are. Okay. All right, you want to switch sides and try again? <clears throat> it's up to you. Are you got another game you want to do, or Is there a third uh, one you wanted to try? Backslapping game. I was just thinking that. Do you want to try that one? Let's do it. All right. This particular game, we don't know an Old Norse name for it, so we just call it the bag slapping game. And this is a fun one to do after a feast if you've all had a little bit to drink beforehand. Bag slapping. Normally it involves blindfolds, but we don't. Oh, no, we do. do we have a blindfold? We have okay. blindfolds. So while not technically a board game, this is it's a fun game. This game is played with two bags stuffed with something weighty That's but soft, like a rolled up towel or a pillow or something of that yeah, sort. It's, it's played it's via with two people who are both blindfolded. And also, the idea is one or each player must keep one of their hands on some central object like a chest or a stump or a barrel or something of that sort. And we'll demonstrate how once we both have blindfolds. Would you do the honors? Thank you. Oh, we got the classic black and white matchup. <laughs> Good versus evil, dark versus light. So once neither of us can see, how do finish tying it? All right, there we go. We put your hand on the bench. We each put our hand on the bench and then and you can be who gets to go first. Today's version so, of your Marco board. First, which means, and now I say this is kind of a Marco Polo thing. You play it with your ears. So I say, hey, Khan. And he says, yes. 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 Be. May I hit you with my bag? Yes. And now he has a chance to hide or move or do whatever he wants to do while still keeping his hand on the chest. So nice. that when I do this, Oh, you missed. I, so I did not get a point. It, it's kind of house rules, depending on what's the win condition. Some people will say first to three points win. Some people will say first to get a tap on their bum wins. You can really decide however you want. But since I missed, it's now his turn. So we reverse the rules. Yes. Yes, you may. Oh. So you get a point now. He did hit you, huh? So now we have a gun. May I hit you with my bag? Yes. Bam! You got me. <laughs> all right. One all. One all. All right, Jimmy. Yes. Can I hit you with my bag. Please do. Oh, all right oh. in the back. So you're up. You're up two. Two, two to silver one. Silver on Hakon. Who, who's gonna bet? <laughs> two silver on Hakon. Who wants to bet on me? I got a horn of mead on Trig B. All right. That's what I'd like to hear. Hakon. Yes. May I hit you with my bag? Yes. Oh! Ow! You all right? Two all. All right, this is game point, ladies and gents. Trigby. Yes. Can I hit you with my bag? You can try. Oh! oh. is our Take glorious on. winner. Is our glorious winner, and I owe you two silver. <laughs> a common way to bet on this game is you have a chest as the central object, and the winner gets the contents of the chest, or possibly the chest itself. In this case, there are a couple more games in here, including Coop, which is a game that takes a little bit too much time to set up and we're not gonna demonstrate tonight, but is a sort of cousin to bowling, if you will. Uh, horseshoes, maybe, too? It's also kind of like horseshoes in that you, the primary goal is to throw your stick at another stick. So most games that um, 
There's Scandinavian all- people that we call Vikings would play. Also our skill builders. If you're having to listen to each other, it's a way of teaching hunting and fighting skills. If you're having to have the dexterity to throw something up, pull a knuckle bone and catch it again, fast hands is important. And as Trigby already mentioned, the Neftoffel is about strategy, about making sure that you're covering all your bases and thinking moves ahead. There's also Here's another game called... Do we have a question? question? We have a general question. What is creative anachronism? Ah. ah. <laughs> anachronism is just the recreation of something from in the past. Kind of something that's lost in time. Lost in yes. time. It's, it's uh, anachronism. Anachronism actually means something that's out of its time. Like if we were to actually travel back to the 10th century and somebody had a wristwatch on, that would be an anachronism. It is out of its time. And so when we are here in contemporary 21st century, an anachronism is a linen kirtle and turtle brooches that are what a woman of the 10th century would have been wearing. So creative anachronism is we try to recreate and um, reproduce the life skills and lifestyles of people who lived a long time ago. And sometimes we put a little bit of a modern take on it, which is where the creative part comes in. For example, I once went to an event where a lady I met was trying out how to make jello shots in an Elizabethan style. And she created it very well. That sort of thing is what we do with the creative part. And also it involves, for example, you are a 10th century monk and I am a 11th century Dane, two people who ordinarily would not even interact at all. But also, for the creative part, it also comes with sharing your knowledge. That's a big thing of what we do here. I've, I've often joked before that the saying, tell me more about that thing you're doing to an SCA member is like saying, let's go for a ride in the car to an excitable dog. Because <laughs> we live not only to learn about the Middle Ages, but to share what we know with each other and the general populace, which is sort of why we put this thing on as well. Yeah. How are we for time? Do we have any more questions uh, about games or, or anything else? And we also want to let everyone know that we are a very close household member. A lot of us live and work together. I work with one of the people who lives with the other people, who works with the other people. So we have all been in close contact with each other. That's why we this are, is our bubble. this is our bubble of people and we're out in the woods in the wide open air. So we just want to let you know that we are practicing safe safety distancing and we are a bubble of people that are very close to each other. Anyone else have anything to say? We've got time. We've got time and we've got time for questions. Anything at all. Fire away. All right. We could do, we could do a rousing chorus of, of, uh, lifeblood. Life, uh, I don't know know that one. Or Boreal Star. Oh, wait. Robin Wood. Oh, we got a couple of questions coming in. Fire away. How many people are in your local group? Oh, in the local Shire? I think last I checked on our actual official books, including children, because we have... Children's activities. A lot of children's activities. I think there's 27 of us that are active members of the Society of Creative Anachronism presently. That's including us here. That's including us here. And Trigby, why didn't you travel back to the 10th century? (laughs) Pardon? Why didn't you travel to the 10th century? Why didn't you stop in the 11th? Well, we decided 11th century because my time machine is currently in the garage. It blew an alternator. It's been all crazy. I'm trying to get the mechanic to get new parts in, but you know how it is. And the TARDIS had left already. We've all heard the story. Tell the truth. You chose the 11th century because you like the clothes. Because I like the clothes. And in the process of, if you want to actually get into the SCA, you make what's called a persona, which is the person you are when you are being an SCA person, if you will. So that usually all it really needs to involve is choosing a time period, a name, and a geographical location, for example. And that can be with any criteria you like. A common thing people will do is trace their own family genetic lineage back to whatever they 
originally this come next from, one's for you. or some people will how just say, how does one join the SCA? How does one join the SCA? How does one join the SCA? <laughs> I'm Brittany. Andy, I do her daughter, and I am the Chatelaine of the Shire of Hadchester. The Chatelaine is the office that's responsible for recruitment and retention. So, in order to join the SCA, you can go to sca.org. The link is in the chat, and uh, you can join directly through there. You fill out an online application. Um, there are dues involved annual fees for domestic membership i believe are 35 dollars, but they might have just gone up to 40. Um, and that uh, gives you uh, a newsletter that tells you when events are going to be happening and what's going on in your local kingdom it also uh, allows you to get into larger events uh, with a with a member discount so if you're going to be going to a lot of events um, yes we'll get to that barbara yeah. turner but you can participate even if you're not a member. You can participate even if you're not a mem a paid, a dues paying member. Yep. Uh, although we are right now encouraging actual membership, um, it's how the society manages to pay the bills. Mem it's a membership driven organization and everybody is a volunteer. So we pay our membership in order to keep the insurance bill paid and keep the lights on in our central office. So and we encourage membership. Do believe there's a program out there that's helping people to enjoy it too. Um, yes right now myself uh lady rathandi and trigley are all part of something called the known world outlaw philanthropist guild we are um, outlaws <laughs> that is operating We're kind of men. outside of the We're spectrum <laughs> we're operating kind of outside the um spectrum of the society itself as our own independent uh group to help facilitate and fund uh memberships and grants for local groups um, who are struggling with the COVID-19 pandemic and being able to help people keep playing um, the game while also supporting the society at large. Cool. Yeah. And what do they do besides that? Do they well, help with memberships? Yes, we, we will fund your membership, no questions asked, um, to help keep people playing. Um, to swell one, our ranks. One thing that wasn't mentioned, uh, Rathandi, is that when you, when you become a paying member, that gives you the opportunity to take a position as an officer in your local groups and local groups have to have a certain amount of officers to maintain their status officers, as a group. What are so that helps a lot. I'm the Seneschal, so that means I'm technically the local president um, of this chapter. Lady Prathandi is our Chatelaine, so she is our newcomer retainer of all the people. Um, Lord Trigby here is our Ninth Marshal, so he runs our um, full our our armored combat practices. We do have a lot of armored combat. That's something we really like. <laughs> <laughs> but you don't have to do. But we do certainly do not have to do yes. if you don't feel like it. If, if you can think of something you love doing in the modern world, there is almost always something that can be translated into the Society for Creative Anachronism. And a lot of people in the SCA are rather of a nerdy sort. So the chances are, if you walk into any campsite in any event and say, hey, do you people play Dungeons and Dragons? You're going to get more yeses than noes. <laughs> and I think that's our time. Are we about to done time, time, Steve? Speaking of disease, speak about diseases in Viking times. Oh, boy. Diseases in Viking times. Oh, boy. Who wants to feel that one? Uh, diseases in Viking times. Ah. All the same diseases that there were in any other culture. A variety of fevers, a variety of dysentery, a variety of parasites. Um, I do believe uh, Vikings made a lot more use of soap, though, didn't they? Vikings were known to be cleaner than most people. Uh, but that didn't mean that they didn't have their share of diseases. And they used the same kind of medicinal herbs and um, apothecary that other cultures in medieval times used. And uh, Leeches and bloodletting? Yeah, later. Later than our 10th century time. Not so much with the leeches and bloodletting in 10th century. How often do you meet? What sort of activities do you do in your meetings? And do you do reenactments like people do with civil war groups? So we try to steer clear of the word reenactment in the Society of Creative Anachronism. We like to say that we recreate the past in the ways that we think it was the best for us to recreate. Not so much um, reenacting specific battles and wars. You're not gonna do you know, a big battle and be like, oh, the French won this time and the English won this time. Everything that we do is kind of happening in the moment. Um, as far as meetings, I, 
I put out that we have a Shire meeting where the entire populace is invited populace once a of month. The Shire. Yeah, the populace of the Shire. Well, and anybody who wants to come from any local group can really pop in. Um, and then every other month is a Shire officers meeting. Um, we also have target archery practices that are held out in Somerville. Um, we have thrown weapons practices that are presently happening, I think in South China still. Um, but we're trying to get some more local stuff happening with that. And these things are usually happening on a bi-weekly or, or monthly basis. Um, also arts and sciences gatherings. You wanna learn how to brew mead? You wanna learn how to do a, amazing textiles? <laughs> <laughs> you wanna learn pretty much anything. You wanna, you wanna color inks, you wanna change yeah. pigments and dyes. Um, you wanna make leather shoes. You, anything you can think of from that era of time with the arts and sciences, we can find some way to help you learn that and spread that to everyone else. Although with COVID-19, the society has instituted um, yes, Steve. Go. safe social distancing practices. So our gatherings, um, we have a lot of really large gatherings that we would normally be doing that have been canceled because of the COVID-19. We're able to do this small group because we live in Maine and our governor has um, given us guidelines for what's safe and because we are a social bubble, we are essentially a single family and we are keeping our social distance within our bubble. Mm -hmm. So our activities are a little bit curtailed right now. However, you should get in touch because we'll be able to let you know when we start back up again and which things are available and how we are translating things to the wonderful anachronism that is the digital world. And are there mixed time periods and personas within each get together? Oh, oh yes, absolutely. absolutely. I have been on the field at Penzik, which is a huge war that we have down in Pennsylvania and literally seen a Ro samurai standing beside- A Roman legion. A Roman legionnaire standing beside a Viking standing beside a Norman soldier standing beside an Ooh. Englishman from the 14th century and a um, picked all and a picked all loaded well. up ready to go um there is a total blending of time uh yeah. and and weaponry like I'm a big martial guy when it comes to stuff as as trivia is mm -hmm. uh, we have siege engines that we we do fun stuff with combat archery um and and then our, then our full contact fighting plus fencing and cut and thrust as well was that settlers of Catan question <laughs> I saw something came up. What's the question? Were there mixed time periods and oh, personas yeah. within the Oh, there was another question that just popped up. We're rapidly losing the light. Are we? Yeah. Um, Let's move over to the fire. Sure, time. We have a little bit more. All right, last call for last questions. Call for questions. <laughs> so I want to say that there is a lot more information out there about the history of the what we call the viking time period um and that you should actually be contacting Speak shane up. and the rockland public library to see what resources they have there mm -hmm. to, about food about textile arts about games about all of the things and we really want to thank shane for inviting us to show you what we do and to share our evening and now i believe sean is going to say goodbye for all of us Actually, we would say I have one more thing to add if I possibly could. Okay. Um, if you have the opportunity that you have an interest in what you see us doing here and you happen to be on Facebook, like many, many are, please search the Shire of Hadchester and request to join the group. Um, and that will put you in touch with us on a more regular basis where you can see when we're posting that we have some things going on and it may help you kind of get in with us a little bit quicker. And also with the COVID-19 pandemic, I've talked to a couple people, and frankly, I think this is n there's no better time to spend learning about this and developing a persona and all those things so that when you're ready to play and the game is back on, you're ready to go. Hadchester is spelled H-A-D-C-H-E-S-T-E-R. We want to thank you guys so much for joining us this evening. Thank you to the audience for coming out to watch this presentation which we um, have been planning for the better part of a year. Again, you can go to sca.org for more information on the Society for Creative Anachronism. So thank you very much, Shire of Hadchester. Don't forget to search for the Shire of Hadchester on Facebook. And this um, 
is Shane at Rockland Public Library thanking you for the presentation and thanking the audience for spending the time with us this evening. Have a great night. I wish you all a safe and peaceful evening. Take good care always. Thank you. Skull. 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 Thanks.